Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Meet the Producers. Uh, my name is Joshua Reynolds, and I am your host uh, from American Legacy Network. And today I get a chance to sit down with Miss Valerie Wilson Reed, um, who uh, is the host and producer of the show Val Cooks, which airs on American Legacy Network, uh, which you can all find at AmericanLegacyNetwork.tv. And so I'm going to introduce Miss Reed, and then we're going to get right into it. So first thing I want to say is uh, Valerie Wilson Reed is a successful entrepreneur and the CEO of Val Cooks LLC, a native Floridian. She received her BA from Marquette University in 1979, majoring in communications. Her corporate career in sales and marketing includes Pops Brewing Company, Hershey Chocolate Company, and G. Hellman Brewing Company. Um, an ardent volunteer, Ms. Reed is a past president of the Marquette University Alumni Association National Board of Directors, past president uh, and founding member of Marquette University's Ethnic Alumni Association, and she's also served on the Diedrich College of Communications Advisory Board, as well as numerous nonprofits, uh, and she resides in Illinois. Uh, so, Valerie, it's good to see you and good to chat with you. How are you doing this evening? Oh, doing great. Doing great. How about you, Joshua? I'm doing pretty good. Very excited to, to talk to you about your cooking show okay. and about you in general. And so, uh, you know, with Meet the Producers, we talk a bit about the show that you produce, your you know, your, your production process, as well as um, who you are as a person. So we're going to talk a bit about the show, a bit about your production, and then uh, I'm going to ask some fun questions uh, towards the end of the interview. Uh, so the first question um, I have for you is, how did you, um, you know, essentially get into the filmmaking uh, uh, world? Well, this, you know, it kind of happened by accident. Uh, but um, as you know, I uh, always love to cook. And so your father happened to have seen one of my recipes. I believe it was my banana pudding recipe and uh, wanted to know if I would be able to produce that for American Legacy Network. And so I didn't know anything about filming or whatever. My daughter had studied film and television, but she was a little bit too busy. Uh, and so um, at the first one, I ended up uh, having a nice young lady who was in, in college to help me try to produce it and all of that. But you know, kids get busy and things like that. So I had to end up trying to learn it on my own and um, asked my daughter, she said, mom, why don't you just go to YouTube? <laughs> and everything you need to know about filmmaking is on YouTube. And so that's exactly what I did. And uh, learned the whole process. And of course, you know, iMovie and all of that. Then I learned about getting lights and then I learned about which cameras to use and uh, which angles to shoot from. And, and uh, now I'm a producer, who knew? <laughs> Right. Sometimes you, you end up in a new career just uh, based off, you know, trying to get your passion out there. Exactly. So what were some challenges that you faced, uh, you know, trying to get up and started and actually taking your passion for cooking and, and turning it into a television show? Well, you know, it was really kind of trying to find the right balance of time to do it. Um, and part of that was, uh, you know, when you're doing a cooking show, I, I pretty much do everything myself, so I have to go to the grocery store, planning that, and making sure that when you get there, uh, when you're getting ready to film, you have to do it pretty much on the same day so it's fresh. Uh, then coming back and doing all the prep work. And so I have to do all the cooking, cooking and chopping and putting it in the right dishes and all of that kind of thing. Then setting up the actual cameras and the lights and all of that type of thing. And uh, so it really, it's a lot of balancing of time. And I try to do all of the filming, shopping, cooking all in one day. Mm. Wow. So that is, that seems like you're wearing a lot of different hats. And, and, and I do the editing the next day. <laughs> and you do the editing. Wow. So you, you cook, you film, you set up the, the scene and everything, and then, and then you edit. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> how was how was learning the editing process for you? Um, it was trial and error. Um, I had a, a young lady uh, show me one time how to do some of the editing. And uh, again, using uh, YouTube, 
uh, and Siri, you know, you ask, ask those questions and you can find out just about anything you want to know. And then it was by trial and error. You know, I had to um, uh, try out different things. I made a lot of mistakes. Sometimes it took a lot of time. Uh, it's just getting over that learning curve. And so, uh, uh, but that's basically how I did it. It's the trial and error. And, and if you look at my beginning um, videos to what they are now, you'll see the transition, you know, of different things that I've learned as I went along. Awesome. And so, you know, you do have a lot of videos on the network. I think we're nearing, uh, nearing almost 100 videos at this point, something to that nature. Close, close to it. It sounds close right. It. it doesn't seem like it because it's been so much fun doing them. Right. And so, I mean, that's actually a really definitely important piece is to say, you know, what you just said is a lot of fun doing it. And when you're having fun, it seems like it's not a lot of work. But the reality is we do know that what you do does take a lot of work. Yes. Um, and so how did you get into to cooking? And how did you get into, yeah, let's just start there. How did you get into cooking? How did you get into cooking? Um, I've been cooking since I was, I made my first meal when I was 10 years old. And um, it's interesting because, you know, while a lot of kids were outside playing and all of that, I was watching Julia Childs on Saturday mornings. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was watching Julia Childs at 10 years old and while other kids were outside playing, and um, my mother finally said, you know what? I'm gonna let you go ahead and prepare the first meal. And I'll never forget it. Um, it was uh, fish in a, a, a parchment paper. And um, it, was, it was quite challenging. Mm. Uh, and she, was, she, she just let me in the kitchen, let me do it. I mean, I've been watching her and learning all along, but yeah, so uh, my first meal that I cooked was, was this fish in, in uh, parchment paper. And, and an orange cake. <laughs> what did you say? An orange cake? Yeah, an orange flavor cake. Yeah. Wow. Now, yeah. Have, you, have you made any of those recently? Uh, no, I have not actually. <laughs> okay. If you said yes, my follow-up question was, do you ship? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. It's funny when I uh, do uh, post the, when you post the recipes on American Legacy, uh, I get phone calls. Okay, and Texas and, and, you know, people on Facebook saying, uh, do you have any left? And, and believe it or not, I, I have some friends. Hi, Terry. I hope you're out there. Hi, Linda. Uh, uh, they come by. Hi, Dana. They come by and picked up uh, uh, what I'm cooking that day because I, I don't know how to cook a small amount. I always cook for a lot of people. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So I'm actually going to share... Um, my screen for a second to show everyone some of the clips that we have of you of your of your work on American Legacy Network. Okay. So we're going to show a little bit of that, um, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about that, of course. Okay. So as everyone can see, um, again, we share a lot of videos on on, on American Legacy Network. Uh, and so we're going to choose a couple just to show just the, the nature of her work. So let's go with um, Val Cook's Mediterranean. Here's a rum cake.
All right, so. so those are my old ones, yeah. Those are your old ones, okay. So we may show a new one later, but I, I want everyone who's watching to, to try to remember those two things and also pay close attention to uh, uh, Valerie and my conversation tonight because we may have a special prize for uh, one of our audience members later on this evening. And we'll uh, get to that when we get to it, but I want you to, to pay close attention to some of the things that we're talking about this evening. So one thing, I'm actually gonna bring up some more pictures of some of the some of your um, food that I got um, onto my screen. But one thing I think um, is very interesting is that your, your recipes seem to come from a lot of different cultures. Yes. And so what, where do you get the inspiration from for your dishes? Well, you know, like I said, the majority of the uh, recipes that I cook are family recipes uh, that I grew up with. Uh, my grandmother, who was Creole, she had always created these wonderful Creole dishes. And then also the influence, I'm originally from Tampa, Florida. And so it has a heavy Spanish influence. And so that's where I get into all of my uh, uh, Italian dishes like lasagna and uh, things with red sauces and things like that. And then, of course, I get into the soul part because I'm from the South. I'm a girl from the South. And so I try to use a little bit of all three of those, that Creole, that, that uh, uh, Spanish, that, uh, that soul, all mixed in uh, together. So I kind of mix and match it as I use it. Do you have a, a favorite... Uh, cultural tradition um, that you like to cook in? Um, cultural tradition. Um, I probably would have to say Creole, uh, since that's what we grew up on mostly is the Creole recipes. Uh, uh, seafood, I mean, seafood, I grew up eating seafood, you know, cracking crabs as a baby. I mean, you know, so I love anything. <laughs> I love anything with seafood. So uh, um, but yeah, they, you know, that's, that's part of the, the culture down there. Wow. And so, you know, what types of spices and seasonings are, 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 you know, that characterize, um, uh, the, the culture that you're, that you, you prefer to cook in? Uh, well, okay. So actually I'm glad you asked that because I, I kind of pulled that there's, there's certain things you will never not find in my kitchen. You will always find these things in my kitchen. And uh, you'll always find garlic, you'll always find green pepper, and you'll always find onion, okay? And uh, just about anything I make will always have onion, green pepper, and garlic. Uh, then it's as far as uh, my sauces and things, you know, I'll always, I always use fresh herbs um, in, in my uh, dishes. My grandmother always said, always go fresh, never go uh, any other way, unless you absolutely have to, uh, with dried uh, herbs and things like that, because it really kind of brings out the flavor of the food. So, uh, yeah, and then another thing that I always like to add uh, that I will always have is turmeric. And what I like, to, I don't know if you can see that here, but what I like to do is peel fresh turmeric, and then I put it in a bag, and I include that in all my red sauces, all my soups, things like that. And that was another thing that she... She always believed in healthy and organic eating. Now, where do you find that those ingredients um, now that you're in Illinois and no longer in the South? Uh, well, I, I can find them at Whole Foods, but um, I must tell you, like, okay, so I get a lot of questions about garlic. And so I, in a lot of my recipes, I use elephant garlic. And so I don't know if you can see the difference between this bulb of garlic and this one. It's, one is huge. This is called the elephant garlic. This is regular garlic. And believe it or not, whenever I go home, I go to Florida, I bring, bring back elephant garlic because there's no place that has elephant garlic like in Florida. And so you should see me going through TSA. It's, uh, they uh, always kind of <laughs> ask me, What's going on here? You can't find that uh, where you are, and I have to tell them no. I have to bring it from home from Florida. Yeah, some things are just not like they are, you know, back at home. So right, right, right. I have to bring them on. Um, so the name of your cookbook, as well as the phrase that we hear you say, is plum bodacious. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, mm, that's plum bodacious. Okay, so where is that? What does that come from? What what is that about? <laughs> 
Uh, that comes from my dad, who was also an excellent cook. And he loved to entertain and all of that, but especially cook for the family. And uh, whenever we would all sit down to gather uh, uh, for one of his meals, it would always be kind of this call response kind of thing going on at the table. So after we've taken a few bites, my dad would always say, speak of it. And we knew what that meant. And so we would always say, mmm, pops, that's plum bodacious. And he would just light up with a smile. And then we knew we could get seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's definitely the key word there is for how, how do I get seconds? <laughs> right, right, right. How do I get seconds? So, you know, as my ode to him, uh, that's what um, I, I always use his as a reminder of, of him. Uh, I you always use that at the end. Mm, that's plum bodacious. And we still do it today when our family gets together. Uh, when we sit down, we'll always say, well, whoever cooked, will always say, speak of it. And we, we would all have to utter, mm, that's plum bodacious. And you better do it with a smile. <laughs> well, that, that makes sense. And I, I have to say that when I do watch your videos and see some of the food you make, I, I definitely do feel that they are mm, plum bodacious. <laughs> <laughs> you one day Joshua I you know what I would I would very much enjoy that if you're ever in the DMV area or if I'm out in Illinois I would I would definitely need to link and that'd be a, a beautiful experience I would um, love to do it and, and speaking of beautiful experiences can you talk about the importance of preserving culinary culture and history um uh, uh you know, within the black culture as, as well as, you know, kind of in a global way, because you, again, include so many different types of, of, um, of culinary traditions. But can you talk about the importance of maintaining culinary traditions? Uh, yes, you know, I think it's very important to pass along these culinary uh, uh, traditions, because a lot of times they come along with stories, you know, stories of, of, the, uh, of, of what went on with your family, back in those days, and et cetera. And that's the way a lot of kids can learn about the grand, great grandparents that they never knew. Or, uh, you know, I know when I, I make a, a particular dish that my grandmother always makes, you know, I always tell them, oh, you remember, you know, grandmommy always used to do this, that, and the other. And I made this dish today so that we can think about her. And so, you know, that's all part of, of, uh, of doing that is, is being able to pass along stories over food. And, uh, and history over food. So that, that, we do that a lot. We do that a lot. Do any stories or history that you learned over food, do any stick out to you or have any really um, maintained a place in your mind and heart? Um, let's see, I would probably, let's see, I'm trying to think which one in particular. Um, well, I, I have to say probably one of my signature dishes is um, uh, what I is, is the paella. I'm, that's what that's my signature dish. Mm. Usually, if you come to any party that I'm throwing or whatever, um, I'm throwing the paella, and and uh, and it gives me an opportunity to talk again uh, about my my father, who uh, was a civil rights attorney, and uh, all of the things that he used to do. And we talk about all of the the importance of doing uh, of voting and all of those things that, that, they, that he had to do along the way. And so it kind of gives you, so when I, when I make a meal that's specific to that particular person, um, we do talk about those types of things. Wow, that's, yeah. that's beautiful. Um, so what, I guess, I, I think I may have touched on this a little bit, but I kind of want to dig a little deeper. Okay. I noticed that some of your dishes are healthy versions of of classic food uh, um but what inspires your 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 um your recipes uh well i always try to make the uh, first of all i i try to use everything organic uh meats vegetables uh all of that um sauces anything that i use i try to use organic um and i also try to make them as light as possible you know, I mean, you know, African Americans have a lot of history of diabetes, et cetera, and we really need to kind of start focusing on our health and the food that we eat. And so you will find a lot of the dishes that I um, prepare, uh, whereas ground beef, 
I substitute for ground chicken with ground chicken. And uh, like my chilies, instead of using ground beef in the chili, I will use ground chicken in the chili. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of little tricks that you can make it look like ground beef uh, with the browning sauce and all of that. If you uh, prepare it with the browning sauce before you start cooking it, it comes out looking like ground beef. But it's a, and it tastes like ground beef, but it has a lighter flavor, a flavor to it. And so how do you respond to folks who say, you know, you're making these different versions of some of our favorite foods. It's just not going to taste the same, or it's just not going to be the same as when grandma made ham hock greens and so <laughs> forth. Because I saw you had a vegetarian or even vegan, uh, a collard green recipe. Right. And so some people are just like, I, well, if it doesn't have ham hock or, 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 or turkey bone in it, I'm not going to do it. So how do you, one, maintain the flavor, and two, how do you respond to people uh, who may be a little nervous to to try something traditional but a new version of it. New version, exactly. Well, I must say, I still do, in some of my uh, uh, collard greens, I still do put ham hocks and all of that. But when I'm trying to uh, focus on, on healthy eating or who I'm preparing the dish for, uh, who's going to be coming and eating the dish with, um, I, uh, I try to use spices that will enhance the flavor of it, like for the collard greens. Um, I believe in that particular, I have several vegetarian recipes, but I believe in that particular recipe, one of the things that I use is a jerk spice. And using, it's a, a jerk paste. And, uh, and I use some of that in there. And it's unbelievable how it gives it that flavor of that smoky uh, ham hock or, or that, that ham or whatever. And you can really fool your taste buds. You really can't tell the difference. But you have to kind of experiment with spices and things like that. But uh, uh, anything that would have a smoky flavor, just think about things that might have a little bit of a smoky flavor. And like I said, that jerk spice works wonders. And you really don't miss the meat when you have it in there. Wow. Yeah. So have, would you say that some of your culinary um, you know, palate has, has expanded since you've moved around and gone to different places around the country. Has that informed what you cook and how you cook? You know, actually, uh, yes, it does. Uh, yes, it does. Uh, and um, I've been very fortunate over the last few years to uh, be able to travel abroad. And uh, so I've been uh, just recently over the last three years, went to New Zealand, to China, and to Africa. Uh, East Africa. And um, I tell you, the East Africa trip really uh, blew my mind as far as the spices. And uh, on one of the trips, um, I went to Dubai and to the spice shops of Dubai. And oh my God, it was just, to me, it was like heaven. Everybody else on the trip were like, yeah, okay. Me, I'm like jumping up and down, <laughs> you know, uh, wanting to take back all and, and forgetting that I only have a sm small luggage, uh, wanting to take back just about everything there. But uh, uh, but what I like to do is once I come back, uh, one, uh, is try to recreate some of the recipes. And actually, when I was there uh, in Africa, uh, some of the chefs were kind enough to actually provide me with their recipes. Wow. And I was able to come back and fix it. Some things I may not be able to find, but I remembered the flavors and I was able to, to duplicate those flavors from things here in the United States. So what's an example of one of those dishes that uh, uh, an East African gave you a recipe for that you're able to duplicate here? Uh, it was a, a halibut masala. Uh, and uh, it was it was phenomenal. And then the thing that, that's, that really struck me over there is that the chefs grew their own, had their own gardens where they grew their own herbs. So, you know, they would go out earlier in the mornings and pick their herbs and spices that they were going to use for their meal at, in the evening, and um, I mean it was it was it was it was just phenomenal. Uh, everything was fresh, and, and you know people forget that when you're buying things that are canned or boxed or whatever, you're mm. getting ingredients that's not healthy for your body. And when you buy fresh and you cook fresh and you watch your portions, you can actually uh, lose weight. And, and just to kind of give you a little taste of that, uh, throughout this whole COVID ordeal, okay, 
I haven't been going out to eat. <laughs> I haven't been going to restaurants. So I've been preparing all my meals here at home and I've lost 18 pounds. Wow, that's, that's phenomenal. And from eating everything fresh, mm. using fresh herbs, organic meats, and you know, still watching your portions, but it's amazing uh, uh, the difference. And as soon as I, you know, I, I did go out one time and all of a sudden I just felt bloated and, uh, uh, you know, just didn't feel right. And it's because I don't have all those preservatives and things in my food anymore. Yeah. I mean, I definitely know what you're talking about. You know, when I was younger, growing up, we um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, initially before we moved to New York. And my, my mother, my, my grandmother, my mother's mother had a garden uh, in their backyard in Cleveland. And, yeah. and I remember going out and picking vegetables and things from the garden. And we would, you know, say pick snap peas from the garden, go into the house, wash them, shuck them and, and yellow and green squash and, and, and cut them up and give them the Gigi, we call her Gigi, give them the Gigi and she would work wonders in there. But I mean, there was really nothing like eating veg vegetables <laughs> that you just got from your garden. I know, isn't you can, you can't, you cannot duplicate that. I mean, uh, um, it's, it's amazing. I'm very fortunate. I have a friend of mine, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, yesterday, she just gave me some things out of her garden. And I was thrilled because like you said, there's nothing fresher than something that's just been pulled out, out of the ground. Now me, I, I do not have a green thumb. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I'm not a gardener. I want to be, I would like to be, but uh, you know, so the closest things I can come to that is uh, going to uh, in the, the summer and spring is going to the, uh, the markets, you know, the open markets. Uh, where the farm, the farmers markets. Okay, yeah. And you can find that a little bit fresher, you know, than than going and getting it from the store because if it's once it hits the store, it's been sitting in the store for a while, and uh, it just doesn't have the same taste. No, I don't. I don't know what it is, but it, I mean, probably preservatives and all types of other things. But it just it, it, there's a huge difference. There's a huge right. difference. And I like to know my food. Mm. I know that sounds bizarre, but I, I like to know my food. I like to know where it came from, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, there's an old joke about knowing, uh, not knowing how the sausage is made. Mm -hmm. Well, I like to make my own sausage because I want to know what's going into it. That, you that, know? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And so what about uh, New Zealand? What kind of dishes and what kind of cuisine do they have over there that, that kind of, you know, left you were interested in? I tell you, uh, the, the food in New Zealand, well, first of all, most of the seafood is either, uh, I mean, most of the food is either seafood or lamb. Uh, I'm not a big lamb person, although I did try it. Um, but uh, the seafood was, was all, everything there is organic. I mean, you don't, when you go into the grocery stores, we went into the grocery stores trying to find something unhealthy. Mm. <laughs> everything that they have, even in their grocery stores are healthy. Wow. Free of preservatives and things like that. And again, you know, here again, you would uh, go to the breakfast places and they would have these pots in front of the doors of their restaurants. And you would go into uh, and you would see them go outside and pull a cut a snip here and there from the pots. And then they come back and they prepare your meals. That's how fresh the food is there. Wow. You know, I mean, it's, it's very healthy eating there as well as being one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. So are we going to see any recipes from New Zealand in, in uh, Val Cook's kitchen? You know, I think, I, you know, I'm trying to think, but I, I um, most of the, the rest, some of the recipes that I have made might have been influenced by that because here again, they do everything with fresh herbs. You know, I have my, I always use my fresh uh, uh, thyme and fresh basil and things like that. So I'm trying, I did start cooking like that specifically when I came back from New Zealand where I saw everything fresh and I felt so good. And, you know, um, uh, and I, I decided to change my whole lifestyle of cooking. Wow. The last country I'm going to ask you about before we transition to our next part is China. I know you said you uh, visited there as well. And, yes. and 
obviously China is a, a very large country, so the cuisine is probably a bit more expansive than what we experience here in the States. What kind of cuisine did you experience over there? Um, let's see. Well, you know, of course they have the, the Peking duck. Everybody has to go do the, the Peking duck. But um, I think probably the one thing that I was um, impressed with uh, was the, um, their, their buffet breakfasts. Okay, if you're in the hotels, I mean, they had noodles and things like that for breakfast. Wow. People were eating all different kinds of things with noodles for breakfast and things like that. Um, we, uh, I had an opportunity to go inside of one of uh, uh, the, in the, si in the cities into someone's home where she prepared for us homemade noodles. And just watching her prepare that, and I mean, you, using her, her knife and just chop, and they make the noodles all by hand and cut the, the noodles by hand. And then she prepared it for us. And it was one of the best things I've ever had. That's my next uh, goal is to, to start making homemade noodles because it was one of the best dishes I have ever had. And wow. again, it's fresh. It's freshly made. Yes. Yeah, so again, something something about fresh food. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's what's recommended by nutritionists, doctors, all, and, and obviously and, chefs as well. Right. And also, too, there was spicy. Uh, the Szechuan, especially when we went into the areas where it was a set, where Szechuan was popular. So you know, every place is popular for different foods. And so this one particular area, oh my God, I was in heaven because I love hot food and spicy. The hotter, the better. I mean, if I'm not crying. You, you, you didn't make it hot enough. And uh, uh, they had some that, that definitely made me cry. <laughs> but it was delicious. It was wonderful. Well, that, that definitely sounds like an experience. Um, right. And for just a moment, we're actually, in, in just a moment, we're going to transition and talk more about your book that's coming out. Okay. Or that actually already is out. I've seen one, but yes, that, the, the one that's called That's Plum Bodacious that I did uh, specifically for uh, American Legacy Network. Uh, and then I am working. I just completed another one uh, in the process of getting that done. Uh, I'll reserve the name on that one for a little later date. But okay. uh, I'm hoping to have it out before Christmas. I'm hoping. Okay, okay great. Yes. So let's talk about uh, That's Plum Bodacious for, for a little bit. Um, so I'm going to bring it up here on the screen. So oh. let, let's talk about Plum Bodacious. Where, so what kind of recipes will we find in, in this book? Uh, you will find some of the, well, first of all, the, the picture itself, the, for the cover picture, that's of, of the dish that my dad was famous for that now I'm famous for, which is the paella that has the chicken and seafood, lobster, shrimp, clams, mussels, uh, uh, chicken, ham, uh, um, yellow rice, saffron. All of those uh, type of spices, and it's absolutely wonderful. And and his secret to it was cooking it in beer, and uh, and that's that's how I, I make that one. Uh, but then all of the other ones, they're all pretty much family dishes. And I remember uh, my my mom and my grandmother and my grandfather, who was also an excellent cook. As a matter of fact, he was a private chef for families in in Tampa, Goosby Jones, many years ago. And uh, a lot of his recipes also are in there as well. Awesome. So these are mostly family recipes. Wonderful. And, and, and with all those recipes, yeah, we ate a lot. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I have personal experience with, with paella uh, when, I, when I got a chance to go out to Barcelona, I guess almost 10 years ago now, but that's the first place I ever tasted it. Uh, uh -huh. And then there's a place not far from here. So I'm really looking forward to your paella. <laughs> well, wait a minute. So you mentioned uh, Barcelona. So I had a friend of mine who was in Spain and tried the paella in Spain, who had also had my paella and texted me from, or not texted me, but Facebooked me from Spain and said that my paella was better than any of them that he had in, in, uh, in Spain. So I'm just saying. You know, that, that sounds <laughs> now, now, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> that sounds like some serious paella. That's some serious paella. You can't have my paella. Yeah. 
So let, can we talk a little bit about the process of you putting the, the recipes together? Now, I know you said they're family recipes. And from my from what I've seen uh, from people who cook from family recipes, that can that's both a really good thing and also a particular challenge. Uh, because in a recipe book, you, you usually have measurements and that type of thing. Uh, but from family recipes, uh, and, and especially oral tradition recipes, a lot of times it's a pinch, a smidget, a little bit of this, a hint of that, and that type of thing. How do you convert from the oral tradition to putting together um, uh, digestible, uh, for lack of a better word, but digestible recipes so that other people can emulate what it is you're doing? Right, right, and, and that I must say that is that has been a difficulty. Uh, you know, someone said, you know, how do we, uh, uh, you know, when you're cooking from your ancestor's recipe, when do you know when is it enough? And he said, when they tell you it's enough. <laughs> so <laughs> right, right. You know, from heaven, I guess. Right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so what I have to do is, as I'm creating the recipe, then I do a little oral thing on my on my phone there, and I'll say. You know, and then I'll actually do what I would normally do without measuring, but then I would put that in a measuring spoon or a measuring cup or whatever in order for me to be able to figure out exactly what that uh, uh, measurement is. Uh, but it is it is a challenge uh, because you know, and, and I have to keep that in mind when I'm doing it because I I you know I, I usually and I'm a fast cook, so mm. you know. Um, I usually just do everything, boom, 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 boom. So I have to slow it down and then actually measure what I would normally put in. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. And so it's interesting you say you're a fast cook um, because a lot of the videos that we have on the network are between one minute and two minutes, uh, oh. which I think are great because you got you get the idea, you get to see the ingredients, the process and everything. What made you want to choose that particular format versus, say, a Julia Child's format where you're kind of staying and watching for, you know, half hour to 45 minutes? What, 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 what caused you to want to make it a, a quicker video experience? Well, you know, I kind of did it because of what I like. Uh, I don't have a lot of time. Uh, so when I'm looking for recipes, if I'm looking for a recipe and then all of a sudden they've got all of this story and, you know, and they're, and by the time, yeah, I, I, I just want the recipe. Just mm. give me the recipe. I don't have time. I just need to know the recipe, the ingredients, and, and a general idea of how it's done. And I, I had heard from other people that the same thing that, you know, I don't want to hear all of this. This is nice. This is great stories and all of this kind of thing, but just give me the recipe. I want the recipe. And, uh, you know, I don't mind doing a full hour. I could prob probably do a full hour cooking show uh, or half hour cooking show. But um, when people are looking things up and they're in a time crunch and they just picked up the kids from school and, you know, they've got the ingredients and, you know, they don't have time for that. They just want to get a general idea. Okay, yeah, this is how it goes. And let me get it done. Okay, makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And, and I uh -huh. think that... The format that you've chosen, I think, is definitely a very, um, it's a very effective format because, again, you get all the ingredients, you get the process, and you get a beautiful picture, a beautiful visual of what, what can happen if 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 uh, if people attempt to do your um, your dishes. Right. And I say it can. Yeah. And it's also difficult editing too. So you right. know, get it down to that just to get it down to that one minute or two minute uh, video. Um, it takes quite a bit of time editing doing that. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people who don't create film don't realize that if you see a two minute clip, you probably put at least an hour and a half to two hours of work exactly. into cutting down to just two minutes. Exactly. And so, yeah. we, we I personally appreciate the labor of love that you put into it uh, to to make it make it so that everyone can enjoy the video. So that's definitely a wonderful work that you're doing. Um, and so for those uh, who are watching on Facebook, um, remember a little while ago, I said, make sure you pay, pay close attention to, um, to, to the conversation that I'm having with Valerie here. And here's why. So American Legacy Network is actually going to give away a couple of uh, cookbooks. Um, uh, uh, that's Plum Bodacious. And so in the comment section of our Facebook, um, in the comment section of our Facebook 
live stream, I would like for some of you to answer the following questions. What ingredient, um, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. What is an ingredient that Valerie has to uh, uh, smuggle <laughs> from home uh, back up to Illinois that she can't get anywhere else? So someone can answer that in the comment section. She did display it. So um, it's an ingredient that seems like it should be common. I'm gonna give a hint, obviously. Uh, but what ingredient does Valerie have to actually fly uh, from the south back up to um, back back up to Illinois whenever she goes home. That's the first question. Um, the second question is, can you name one of the countries or one of the areas of the world uh, that Valerie traveled to and was uh, influenced in her cuisine? So she named a couple of countries in one region. If you can name one of those countries in one of the region in the comment section, um, we, we will uh, maybe have a prize for you as well. So the two questions, what is the, uh, the food item, the ingredient, and then what is one of the countries that uh, Valerie has traveled to, uh, to uh, that have influenced her, her culinary skills? So those questions are out there and there are a couple people starting to answer. All right, so I'm gonna ask you a few questions and we'll, when I feel the answers that we're gonna um, see who gets it right and we will choose two winners uh, to, to win one of the books that uh, American Legacy Network uh, will provide. And so we'll inbox. But for the last couple minutes of our, of our time together, uh, we wanna talk about who is Valerie? So I have a couple of fun questions I'm going to ask you, um, and they're not necessarily related to cooking, but you can relate the answer to cooking if you feel like it. Are you ready? I, I'm scared. I'm scared now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be scared. Don't be scared. I promise you the questions will be semi-painless. <laughs> okay, so I'll relate the first one to cooking. So um, who is a musical artist that you may listen to while you're preparing a meal? Yes, okay. Uh, can I give you two? You can give me two, you can give me five, you can give me one, you can give me two. The mighty, mighty OJs. Oh, wow. One. And okay. then the other one is uh, a young man that I have just absolutely fallen in love with his music. Um, he's a hometown guy here from Illinois. And his name is David Davis. I love him. As a matter of fact, I even, uh, he was even the performer at my daughter's wedding. But he is now hitting it big time, and I'm so proud of David. And uh, so I listen to David quite a bit. Wow. Okay, great. So who are, let's go this way. Who are top your top five chefs or cooks outside of yourself? Oh, my. Okay. Uh, let's see. I would have to say my, uh, alive or dead? Alive or dead? Okay. Uh, of course, Julia Childs. Um, my grandfather. My grandmother. I'll say their names. Goosby Jones, Maria Jones. Um, my dad, Charles Wilson. Um, and I would have to say B. Smith. She was also one of my idols. And uh, we lost B this past, within this past year. And um, she's just one of my all time favorite people. I uh, was blessed to have been able to meet her. And uh, um, I would have to say B. Smith. Yeah, B. Smith was definitely a, a great woman. I had the opportunity to meet her once as well, several years ago. And, you know, she definitely leaves an impact just, just even being in the same space. Yes, uh, inspiration. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Uh, so what type of books do you like to read outside of um, let's see, I am, well, lately it's been political, but I don't even want to go there. Uh, but my genre that I really uh, love is African American female mystery writers. Okay. Wow. Yes. I mean, that's a specific category that I uh, collect their books and I still have their collection to this day. Do you have any authors from that uh, from that genre that you'd like to share with everyone? Um, let's see. Oh, um, oh dear. I'm trying to think of her name, um, but 
Oh dear. Oh, you would ask me that. See, I have to go to my shelf and take a look at it, but. Okay, um, no worries. Uh, uh, Octavia, uh, Octavia Butler too. Yes. Okay. I like her. Yes. Uh, although hers was more sci-fi genre, but I could say that she comes to mind at first. And then uh, Neely, um, oh gosh, her last name is Neely. And she had quite a few, um, I think she just recently passed as well. And uh, she had a series of books that were mystery writers as well. Okay. Yeah. So if someone, if a young person wants to, to get into cooking and get into even uh, doing what you're doing, which is, you know, having a cooking show, what kind of advice would you have for them and how would you encourage them in moving forward? Uh, first, have the passion for it. Uh, and then uh, try to learn as much about cooking as possible. Uh, don't be afraid to try um, new things, how, uh, even uh, change recipes. Um, one of the ways that I taught my daughter how to cook, uh, she does it by smell. And so sometimes she, she may not even eat something that she cooks because she, she was a very picky eater, but she was a great cook because she knew what smelled right together. So, you know, always trust your sense of smell and your sense of taste and try different recipes. Um, but also, if you wanted to, to uh, you know, watch other uh, chefs and cooks, home cooks, and, um, and then, you know, follow YouTube and find out how to actually go through and do the process of, of uh, filming and editing. And, you know, you'll have to invest in lighting and all of those kind of things in order to, to, to get it going. But, uh, and, and to be honest with you, uh, if you have an iPhone, great. Most of my videos are cooked, are done with the iPhone, especially the, the later uh, videos that I've done were done with the iPhone, yeah. Wow. So, so what's next for, for, for you and, and your cooking show journey and just your journey in general? Um, well, you know, again, I'm coming up with the book uh, the second book. And um, eventually, I think I would like to do a 30 minute, you know, or hour show. Uh, and so that's one of the next goals that I'm, I'm looking at and looking forward to. Okay, awesome. So the last thing is, how can people get in touch with you? How can we learn more about you? How can we communicate with you and connect with you? Okay, uh, the best way is Instagram. And it's Val Cooks. And that's V-A-L-C-O-O-K-S, like in Sam, underscore kitchen. So Val Cook's Kitchen uh, at, uh, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, they can also go to valcooks.com, mm -hmm. which will also uh, show you information about the book and all of other things that I'm doing. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So thank you so, so much for taking your time out today to, to share with us and share a bit about your cooking, a bit about what inspires you, a bit about you, uh, as well as, as uh, your show. So again, everyone, I highly encourage you to subscribe to American Legacy Network at AmericanLegacyNetwork.tv so that you can also become a great cook um, like Valerie here and check out her her many many videos and also stay tuned because next week we have our final two meet the producer events uh uh next tuesday or uh next on the 29th rather we have jeff watkins and on the 30th we have dante james um the last thing uh before we get we're done with this show is i'm gonna announce the two winners who uh who actually answered our questions correctly um, and so our two winners are Dolores Jones, as well as Terry Thomas Nolan. And so the answers that they gave, the first answer was elephant garlic. And so that is a, a, a form of garlic that you can't find anywhere else. And so, uh, elephant garlic. And then also, pardon me. You can find it online. You can find it online. Yeah, Amazon sells it. <laughs> Amazon, okay. <laughs> Amazon sells it. I can pick my own, so anyway. Um, and then also, one of the countries that, or areas that you uh, traveled to was Dubai. And so um, the two of you guys uh, answered both of those questions, uh, Dubai and Elephant 
uh, garlic. So we're going to connect with you to make sure that you can receive your prize of Plum Bodacious, or That's Plum Bodacious, um, the cookbook by Valerie Wilson. So thank you so, so much again for joining us. And can I just say one more thing? Yes. Please go vote. Agreed. And you know, it's been my pleasure. Absolutely. And on that note, we're going to end our live stream. Thank you so much.